Earth, Eco-Anxiety and Entangled Grief is an exhibition of work exploring how worry about climate change and ecological collapse is seeping into our lives and dreams, mixing with other fears and anxieties, and entangling with personal experiences of loss. In this ecosystem of grief, art is a place for picturing and shaping bad feelings, including bad feelings about the very act of making art. Each gesture of making is weighed against the desire to do no harm and the impossibility of a harmless human life within the context of our extractive capitalist system. We grieve our own existence, as well as our eventual demise. The works in this exhibition sit with and in that grief. They also sing of the ways that grief can open us up. We become capacious, raw, and changeable. We can follow our grief towards wilder and deeper feelings, towards greater empathy for the other beings with whom we share the planet, and towards and into the rhythms of life and death. Laura Finley's verdant paintings take us out into the garden at midnight. They exist in the millisecond of a camera's flash, an instant of blinding illumination in the dark. Like laughter after a funeral, their color is intense and raucous and fleeting, moments of light that wipe out the darkness, but only briefly. In a familiar world, made strange and slightly menacing, we catch surreal glimpses of faceless birds, grimacing daisies, and fat white slugs slithering over a rose. Finley paints quickly, laying down color in strokes that feel bold but also hurried, like there isn't much time, like it's now or never. This panic-tinged sense of urgency connects her work to our dizzying moment, in which any knowledge of the catastrophic extent of the damage we have done to our planet can be hard to reconcile with the pleasantness of a summer evening in the backyard. In Finley's paintings, things seem both fine and completely wrong. We feel the vivid beauty of existence, and we know that we don't know what is lurking in the darkness of our imminent future. Xiao Jingyan's Lingxi girls are busts made of mycelium, cultivated Lingxi mushrooms, and wood chips. With fungi erupting through their placid expressions, the twin Lingxi girls act as sentinels watching over worried earth. Both mushroom and human, neither living nor dead, the girls trouble taxonomy. Yan writes, in Chinese mythology, it is believed that all things have spirit and are capable of acquiring human forms, magical powers, and immortality when they absorb the nimbus of the universe and the prime of the sun and moon. When there is a lack of energy during the transformation, they may still keep some of their animal or plant traits. This resonates with the work of anthropologists Anna Leuvenhelp Singh, author of The Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist Ruins who writes that human nature is an interspecies relationship. Singh asserts that no part of the human experience can be properly understood without reference to our complex macro and micro interactions with companion species of all kinds. The Lingxi girls make this deep hybridity explicit, with human and fungi existing and making art in collaboration. speaks of the need to create wonder in the midst of dread as we try to figure out how to continue living on a damaged planet. Like Xiao Jingyan's Lingxi girls, Connie Chapel's stone lung is an object of wondrous dread. The sculpture lurks on the floor of the exhibition space like a hybrid life form. The starting point was an uprooted stump of a birch tree that, when pulled from the earth, was found to be clutching a stone in its roots. Chapel added a found mannequin hand and a plastic hairnet, and all these dead things together take on a haunted kind of creaturely life. The hand is outstretched, offering what could be a benediction, curse, or entreaty. Remember that we are connected, and that our fates are intertwined. Our garbage and our human arrogance will come back to haunt us, so we need to figure out how to live with our ghosts. Del 
Rosario's sculptures are assembled from the stuff of daily life. Dryer lint, onion skins, turmeric, charcoal, and salt are clumped together with shredded plastic netting, polystyrene, gyprock, and cement. Her work speaks to the chaos and thinginess of civilization, to the abundance of our detritus, and the provisionality of our assembled selves. Del Rosario's sculptures have many lives. Not only are they made up of youth's things, but her completed pieces are often taken apart and repurposed, shifting shape and taking on new forms. Del Rosario's work reminds us of the inherent changeability of the world and the necessity of reimagining all our givens, our social structures, our economic systems, and our many, many consumer goods could all be put together quite differently in the future. There is a crumbly optimism here. It's not easy making something fresh from something rotten, or something just from something cruel, but there is still beauty in fumbling towards new forms of being together. Maureen Grubin's Stitching My Landscape, on view across from the main gallery space, shows a work of large-scale land art created by Grubin in 2017, in which 111 ice holes were connected by 300 meters of blood-red broadcloth zigzagging across an expanse of frozen ocean south of Tuktoyaktuk. This piece reverberates with personal and cultural experiences drawing on Grubin's memories of her brother tossing bloody strings of seal gut out onto white snow, as well as recalling the traditional Inuvaluit practice of hand-stitching facial tattoos. In Grubin's work, landscape and body, ice and skin, thread and gut become metaphors for each other, emphasizing the intimate connection of human, seal, and earth. Her act of puncturing and stitching the ice reads as both wound and reparation, underscoring the human ability to not only destroy, but also tend to our environment. In its poignant beauty, it offers us an opportunity to meditate on what it means to heal and be healed by nature. Natalie Goulet's photographs grapple with a vertiginous sense of eco-anxiety. Her work explores and materializes the existential paradox of being an art maker and a living person in a time when it's hard to escape the conclusion that not making or not being might be better for the planet. Her work teeters on the edge of non-existence. Using expired film stock, she takes photographs of melancholy people and landscapes and then subjects the often distorted images to a range of maltreatments that push them nearly into the abyss of obliteration. In Vessels, an image of the North Atlantic disintegrates into lacy bits where the original Polaroid was dipped in water. In Roots, Bones and Ashes, a picture of old-growth forest has been microwaved into rainbow-hued ripples and a brief respite from fear shows a figure in a landscape, a self-portrait, peeking through a hole in an overlaid Polaroid that has been burnt to a crisp. In these gestures, Goulet makes explicit fears of forest fires, rising sea levels, and a warming planet. Goulet has described her frequent use of self-portraiture as an attempt to accept her own existence and to work through self-destructive tendencies. By making herself a muse, she can picture and safely enact forms of self-obliteration while also affirming the beauty of her fraught connection to the world. There is a lot of talk at the moment about the cost of living. Usually, this turn of phrase is involved in discussions of rising gas prices, high rents, and expensive groceries. But Janine Marsh's work invites us to think about the phrase in other ways, connecting it to the same existential dilemma that underpins Goulet's photographs. The invitation is subtle and easily missed. A tiny newspaper clipping with these words is affixed to a flattened coin, part of a wiry posy of dead daisies coated in rubber. Quietly, 
but insistently. Marsh's delicate bouquets tie worries about inflation, to the grief of living on an endangered planet, and to questions about the nature and cost of money. The leaves of Marsh's flowers are made of coins flattened on railway tracks. Under the weight of a rumbling train, cash becomes shape. When the faces of monarchs and symbols of a nation and capital are obliterated by pressure, a magic and illicit transformation occurs. Marsh shows us just how easy it is to steal money's meaning and to rebel against the crushing forces of colonial capitalism. Although her act of defiance is small time and low key, this is part of its magic. She makes rebellion accessible and reminds us of our inherent capacity to lay flowers on the grave of systems that harm us, even before they're fully dead. I am conscious now of two intertwined temptations. One is the impulse to speak towards hope, and the other is the beckoning abyss of despair. Neither, I think, is quite right. Our problems are too vast, our art and efforts too powerless, to make hope entirely credible. And yet despair seems like a failure of imagination. The works in this exhibition have helped me to think through the ways that hope and despair cling to each other and wrap around one another like vigorously twisting vines. My grief and anxiety are entangled with my love for the world and for my children and their future. So if you, like me, are worried about the earth, if dread has become the climate in which you live and eat and try to sleep, if your eco-anxiety seeps into your political outrage, and your fear of death, and your many kinds of grief, and your toxic consumerism, and your COVID fog, and your capitalist ennui, and your complete and utter exhaustion, then perhaps this exhibition will be a place where you can sit with all of that and feel, well, not better exactly, but in good company. <laughs>